We're here tonight to learn something. The great thing about working at a university and working in a college and having the opportunity to bring in people like tonight's guest is that we constantly are learning. Usually a different perspective or a different context or something we had never heard of before about somebody or some event or some period of time that we thought we were pretty smart about. That's what I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, and tonight we get to hear a little bit about a figure that most of us have read about, somebody many of us have admired for different reasons, whether it was his uh, ability to communicate or his stubborn courage and pride or whether it was his ability to lead and influence a nation in a time of crisis. All of those things mark the career of Winston Churchill. But none of us knew him like tonight's speaker. And here to introduce that speaker tonight is the director of the Scowcroft Institute, former director of USAID, among a list of other notable achievements, the Honorable, the Right Honorable, and almost Reverend Andrew Natsios. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is Celia's third presentation. And I must say, I've learned, I thought I knew a lot, as I've read I don't know, a dozen biographies since I was a young man. Have Churchill's one of my great heroes. But I learned, and there's, some of them are not in any of the textbooks. So you will be treated this evening so, to a unique perspective, including some jokes. I don't know if you're gonna tell the jokes this evening. So you, I thought I knew all the jokes, stories, but you, you know new ones. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs event this evening in the Bush School of Government with uh, Ms. Celia Sands. As, as Mark said, I'm Andrew Natsius, the director of the center of the Institute. Celia will speak about her grandfather, Winston Churchill's leadership style, including his many inspiring speeches. I've heard Brits who remember the war say sometimes the only thing we thought the country was functioning on during the, the Blitz was Churchill's speeches, which are arguably the greatest speeches of the 20th century. Celia is an internationally acclaimed author, journalist, television presenter, and speaker. Celia has published five books on various aspects of Winston Churchill's life. These combine intensive historical research with personal anecdotes recalled from the time she spent with him in England and abroad. Her most recent book, We Shall Not Fail, The Inspiring Leadership of Winston Churchill, describes the principles of leadership which enabled Winston Churchill, Britain's prime minister from 1940 to 1945, to lead his country and the rest of the free world to overwhelming victory against Nazi Germany and its allies in World War II. Another of her books, Chasing Churchill, is the basis for a documentary which was published, or which was aired on PBS in the United States and on the Discovery Channel in the UK in 2008. Presented and narrated again by Celia Sands, the program describes her grandfather's extensive military, political, and private travels across the world, including the many journeys in which she accompanied him. It includes fascinating interviews with some of those who met Churchill during the course of these travels or whose parents or grandparents had done so. This riveting portrait of one of the 20th century's iconic figures as painted by someone who knew him as Grandpapa. Please join me in welcoming Celia Sands to the stage. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming. I'm having a lovely time at Texas A&M, and I'm really grateful to have been invited. And I'd like to thank Dean Mark Welsh for s kicking the evening off and for introducing Andrew, who gave such a nice introduction, and where Andrew's got to. Oh, you're there, okay. <laughs> and special thanks to my friends, Richard Box and Davis Ford, who introduced me to this wonderful university, and who, with President Michael Young, Tyson and Christy Vocal, Charles Schwartz, Dr. Frank Ashley and Dean Mark Welsh made my visit possible. I'm also very grateful to, to Lawrence Zajusek, who's worked so hard with all the arrangements for my visit and is working at this moment to make sure I get out of here tomorrow morning in the lightning. <laughs> I've had a wonderful time on this my second visit. I'll be sad to leave tomorrow, but thank you all so much for what you've done. 
Tonight, I'm going to stare the, share the stage with my grandfather and his powerful speeches. These speeches are the ones during World War II. Of course, he did make other ones, but these are the ones that people remembered. They were the speeches that brought families together during the war on both sides of the Atlantic, sitting round beside the fire or round the kitchen table, taking comfort and inspiration from his rising words. Winston Churchill was the master of words, spoken and written. Today, I'm going to give you some examples of how my grandfather used words to inspire and lead the world through the greatest challenge it had ever faced. As a politician, my grandfather's speeches became some of the most famous ever made. As a journalist and author, he used his words to support his family and his own extremely extravagant lifestyle. When he was staying once at the Plaza Hotel in New York, they rang through and said, is everything to your satisfaction? He said, I'm a man of simple tastes, easily satisfied by the best. <laughs> Whenever he needed money, he picked up his pen, and as his children used to say, we lived from pen to mouth. <laughs> During his life, Winston Churchill wrote 44 books and countless articles and was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was thrilled with that, but he would really like to have had it for peace. But it was during the Second World War that my grandfather's words really came into their own. The impact was more powerful than any weapons. On making him an honorary citizen of the United States, President Kennedy said Winston Churchill mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. Whether speaking in the House of Commons or on the radio, the effect was profound. So many people have told me how his speeches gave them hope when they were in despair. Wherever they listened, here in the United States, in London during the Blitz, or in occupied Europe, where possessing a radio, let alone listening to it, carried the risk of death, everyone remembers those moments. My grandfather knew that the only way that he could inspire people was to make them believe that he believed he could win victory. As time passed following his death in 1965, Winston Churchill became an historical figure that fewer and fewer people could actually remember. Then, following the tragic events on September the 11th, he stepped out of the pages of the history books and back onto the international stage where he had been for so long. Leaders everywhere called on the memory of Winston Churchill for inspiration. The speeches of both President George W. Bush and Prime Minister Tony Blair rang with Churchillian tones, confirming that Winston Churchill's inspiring example and leadership were as relevant in 2001 as they were in 1940. Whether faced by the global financial crisis, the Eurozone disaster, or the war in Afghanistan, the constant cry is, we need another Churchill. So why is it that leadership is so sought after today? It's always been important, but there seems to be something about the present age that makes it even more important than ever. Leadership is about change. The very best leaders are those that are able not only to deal with change, but also to anticipate it. They are the ones who make sense of what is happening and also look ahead, explain the situation to others and offer a vision of how to move forward. <coughs> Churchill exemplified that characteristic in the 1930s and the 1940s. He was not only able to lead his country in its darkest hour, he was also the most inter articulate interpreter of what was happening and what was likely to happen. He saw before most what Hitler represented and what he would do. <coughs> A few years later, he saw more clearly than most what the post-war period would be like. His famous Iron Curtain speech, delivered in March 1946 in Fulton, Missouri, was much criticized at the time. In it, he said, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. How right he was. 
That speech showed him at his perceptive best, a leader who was every bit as good at analysing developments as he was at leading people through them. These skills come to the fore in times like the present, when everything seems to be changing. From safety in our cities, to the climate, to the internet-driven revolution in the way we do business, and in the way we relate, we relate to our friends and even our families. These are the times when we need the best leadership we can get. Leaders who can deal with the threats that face us and seize the opportunities. Churchill became Prime Minister at the age of 65 in the most daunting circumstances imaginable. Hitler's blitzkrieg was overrunning continental Europe. Britain was about to stand alone. But strong leaders welcome a challenge. This is how Churchill described his emotions at the time. Okay. I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. Eleven years in the political wilderness had freed me from ordinary party antagonisms. My warnings over the last six years had been so numerous, so detailed, and were now so terribly vindicated that no one could gainsay me. I could not be reproached either for making the war or with want of preparation for it. I thought I knew a good deal about it all, and I was sure I should not fail. Therefore, although impatient for the morning, I slept soundly and had no need for cheering dreams. Facts are better than dreams. In this speech, my grandfather was reflecting the flat fact that his whole life had been devoted to inspiring leadership. The most well-known examples of leadership in his life come from his political and military activities, but they translate seamlessly into any other sort of leadership. The main pillars of his leadership were courage, integrity, vision, and communication. He recognised that all four were essential characteristics of the effective leader, but regarded courage as the most important. He wrote, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. It is moral rather than physical courage that is most important for great leaders, for upon, upon it depends a leader's integrity. Integrity is probably the element that is most questioned in politics today. No one displayed greater integrity than Churchill, the politician. He believed in and followed certain principles, at the same time reserved the right to change his mind, which he explained like this. The only way a man can remain consistent during changing circumstances is to change with them while reserving the same dominating purpose. <coughs> In 1904, as a young politician, he preached the merits of free trade at a time when his party was bent on, on protection. Despite the fact that he had a bright future, he took the considerable political risk of leaving his Conservative Party and joining the Liberals, of which he remained a leading member for 20 years. 25 years later, by then having filled half a dozen high cabinet posts, first as a liberal and then once more as a conservative, Churchill's integrity led to him being excluded from office for the next 10 years. At the beginning of the 1930s, he opposed the government's grant to, to give India near independence within the British Empire. We may judge with hindsight that he was mistaken over India. But what was never in doubt was his integrity. Churchill remained at odds with his party through the 1930s as he warned unsuccessfully against the threat of a resurgent Germany. As a result, he was left in the wilderness till he was found to be indispensable to his country in its darkest hour. Then, with Churchill as Prime Minister, the nation saw leadership as it had never been seen before. He addressed Parliament honestly. I would say to the House, as I said to those who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. 
you ask what is our policy, I will say it is to wage war by sea, land and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. There were those who, unable to see the way to victory, were disposed to make a deal with Hitler. Stamping his leadership on a wavering government, Churchill explained the grim situation before concluding, if this Long Island history of ours is to end at last, let it end only when each of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. There was spontaneous approval. Britain would fight on. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas <laughs> and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. There are two lessons to be learned for all leaders from Churchill's political career through the 30s. From his stand over India, not to persist in unwinnable battles, but from his op opposition to appeasement, to stick to one's guns when faced with a threat to one's fundamental interests. As a leader, Churchill's vision ranged over a wide field. Most significant was his strategic vision of American involvement in the defense of the free world. As early as August 18, 1940, the House of Commons heard his views on that subject. Undoubtedly, this process means that these two great organizations of the English-speaking democracies, the British Empire and the United States, will have to be somewhat mixed up together in some of their affairs for mutual and general advantage. For my own part, Looking out upon the future, I do not view the process with any misgivings. I could not stop it if I wished. No one can stop it. Like the Mississippi, it just keeps rolling along. Let it roll. Let it roll on full flood, inexorable, irresistible, benignant, to broader lands and better days. My grandfather's political vision had been demonstrated as a young journalist in 1900, when during the Anglo-Boer War, the tide turned in favor of the British. He advocated magnanimity towards the defeated enemy. The establishment was outraged and the war continued. It would take almost 50 more years before magnanimity would be generally recognized as the best policy for the victorious. When in 1911 he became First Lord of the Admiralty, he met the sort of problem and opposition that newly appointed leaders often meet. There was the need to reorganise the staff of the most powerful navy in the world. It was a task that Churchill carried out with tact, moving some respected figures sideways rather than retiring them in order to retain their support. The larger the vision, the greater the catastrophe should it fail. Churchill's vision in 1915 fueled the only original strategic idea in World War I. This was the Dardanelles campaign in the Eastern Mediterranean, designed to outflank Germany and secure victory without the slaughter of trench warfare. It failed largely because Churchill's authority did not match the responsibilities that he had assumed. Here is a letter in itself for ambitious leaders impatient to make their mark. It was the lowest point in his life. My grandmother said, I thought it would kill him. He had it in mind when he later wrote, everyone threw the blame on me. I have noticed they nearly always do. I suppose it is because they think that I shall be able to bear it best. 
When visionaries fail, they invariably bounce back. At the age of 41, Churchill rejoined the army and went to fight in the trenches. Within three years, he was back in the cabinet. He once said, I am always ready to learn, but I do not always like being taught. <coughs> the Dardanelles disaster rankled with him ever after, but he applied the lessons from it when in World War II, he ensured that all the elements of the war effort were fully coordinated. In 1959, when I was cruising with him on Aristotle Onassis' yacht in the Mediterranean, it was decided to go through the Dardanelles at dead of night so as not to upset him. The next morning, he said, they thought I wouldn't know where we were. But of course I did. Of course he did. He wasn't going to be fooled. He loved maps and would have been following the journey hour by hour. He always travelled to the White House with his map man, and he was responsible for the, for the map, map room in the, in the White House because President Roosevelt was so impressed. The list of Churchill's visionary innovations is long and varied. Pension schemes and social security in the early 1900s, the tank and naval aviation in World War I, the promoting of radar before World War II, and the Mulberry Harbours for D-Day are just a few. He was never frightened of questioning the experts and experimenting. At the end of World War II, Churchill found himself once more out of office. But by then, he commanded the world stage, and his warning of the Cold War in the Iron Curtain speech at Fulton, Missouri, epitomized his courage and vision. He knew that in the aftermath of war, his words would not be what the leaders of the Western world wished to hear. But he felt that they needed to hear them and hear them clearly and unequivocally. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. What is needed is a settlement. And the longer this is delayed, the more difficult it will be, and the greater our danger will become. From what I have seen of our Russian friends and allies during the war, I am convinced that there is nothing they admire so much as strength, and there is nothing for which they have less respect than for weakness, especially military weakness. As he had anticipated, these words attracted universal criticism. But within a year, his analysis had been widely acknowledged as visionary and entirely correct. Vision and courage to challenge convention count for little unless a leader can convey his or her ideas clearly and convincingly. Even today, 60 years after the event, you can listen to my grandfather's words without ever saying, what on earth did he mean by that? This is what he said when praising the fi fighter pilots in 1940 during the Battle of Britain. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Unlike many modern leaders, he did not try to spin a loss into a win. In 1940, he could have construed the unexpectedly successful evacuation of so many troops from Dunkirk as a victory. It's sometimes been portrayed like that. Instead, he told the story straight with this warning to Parliament. Sir, we must be very careful not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuation. Great leaders bring out the inner strength 
that people often do not know that they possess. It's been said that Hitler could persuade you that he could do anything, but that Churchill could persuade you that you could do anything. Churchill gave each and every man and woman an heroic role to play. This is how he challenged the British people to give their all when Britain stood alone. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our <coughs> empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Present day leaders in all spheres can take heart from the fact that Churchill was not a naturally gifted speaker. He overcame a speech impediment, a difficulty in pronouncing the letter S and when he was very young, he went to a specialist saying, I'm in the army now, but I will later enter politics. I cannot spend my whole life avoiding the letter S. <laughs> in fact, his difficulty with the letter S did not go away and became something of a trademark. As a young man, he could be heard walking up and down reciting, the Spanish ships I cannot see for they are not in sight. He still spoke like that right through his life. He learned from others. When he was 21 and passing through New York City, he struck up a friendship with Burke Cochran, a distinguished lawyer and politician. Churchill said of Cochran's political oratory, he was my model. I learned from him how to hold thousands in thrall. As an orator, my grandfather's prodigious memory was a tremendous advantage, but it did not eliminate the need for preparation. He spent hours rehearsing his speeches in front of a mirror. Once his valet thought he heard my grandfather calling him from the bathtub. On inquiring what was needed, he was told, I wasn't speaking to you, I was addressing the House of Commons. <laughs> in his acceptance for his honorary degree at Harvard, he raised a laugh from the audience when he seemed accidentally to say the infernal combustion engine he quickly corrected to the internal combustion engine. His secretary told me how she had overheard him on the train from Washington practicing the mistake. He did not use speech writers. His close friend, F. E. Smith, the Earl of Birkenhead, said Winston has devoted the best years of his life to preparing his impromptu speeches. <laughs> there are lessons here for modern leaders whose speeches often betray their origins in committees. Communication skills apply not only in the delivering of soaring speeches, but also in everyday events. Churchill's wit was a useful part of his armoury, and when an opposing speaker in a parliamentary debate said, must you fall asleep when I'm speaking, he, uh, he said, without opening his eyes, no, it is purely voluntary. <laughs> and reflecting on his less than perfect education when receiving another honorary degree in Miami, he said, no one has passed so few examinations and, and, re and received so many degrees. He had a great respect for women, but from time to time they drove him to make them the object of his sharp wit. Nancy Esther was the first woman prime minister, woman, woman member of parliament in England. She and my grandfather did not get on at all. And one day she said, Winston, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your coffee. 
And he replied, and if you're my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> In the early 1930s, he went on a long journey around North America, going on the Canadian Pacific Railway, dropping down to Vancouver, and finally ending up in Richmond, Virginia. And it was there that I got the oldest memory from the youngest witness, Harry Bird Jr., who was a lovely man, and he was 14 when his father, Harry Bird Sr., was the governor of Virginia. And he remembered my grandfather going to stay there. And he and his father were great fans of my grandfather. His mother was not. Mrs. Bird got very upset, and my grandfather stayed for 10 long days. And he was not a good guest. He wanted to change the meal times to tummy time. And he wanted to change the menus to what he wanted to eat. But much worse than anything else, he ran around upstairs in his underwear. <laughs> Serious speeches were leavened with humor. In surveying the war and speech to the Canadian Parliament at the end of 1941, he recounted his, his words to the French government. When I warned them that Britain would fight on alone, whatever they did, their generals told their prime minister and his divided cabinet, in three weeks, England will have a neck wrung like a chicken. Some chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and talking of chicken, at a state banquet that was given for me, chicken was on the menu. And when the butler came round with the dish and handed it to my grandfather and asked him which bit of the bird he would like, he said he'd like some breast. The lady sitting next to him said, Mr. Churchill, in this country we say white meat or dark meat. The next day she got a posy of flowers the card read, please attach this to your white meat. <clears throat> Without pomposity, his wit dealt with the tricky sort of situation in which leaders sometimes find themselves. He was sitting out in the margins of a wartime conference at the White House when an inebriated GI put his head round the door and we assume not recognizing him, said, hey, fatso, where's the John? <laughs> to which Churchill replied, turn left in the corridor, and you'll see a door marked gentleman, but don't let that deter you. <laughs> Courage, integrity, vision, and the ability to communicate were the main pillars of Churchill's leadership, but there were other important elements. In his first six weeks as Prime Minister, he made five dangerous flights to France in the hope of putting steel into the French government, which was on the point of collapse. That was just the beginning. During the course of the war, he went to Canada three times, to Moscow twice, to America six times, to Tehran, Casablanca and Yalta, in addition to visits to the battlefronts of the Western Desert, Italy and Normandy. When he became Prime Minister in 1940, he relegated to the past the mistakes of his predecessors by declaring in Parliament, if we open a quarrel between the past and the present, we shall find we have lost the future. Of allies, Churchill said, when one looks at the disadvantages attaching to alliances, one must not forget how superior are the advantages. In business as in war, pragmatism will depend determined the best form of alliance. When Ru Russia was invaded by Germany in 1941, he reconciled his support for Russia with his loathing of communism by declaring, if Hitler invaded he hell, I would at least make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. <laughs> Strong leaders should never appear desperate, as we see from Churchill's courtship of President Roosevelt in the two years of war before Pearl Harbor. 
with Europe overrun, it seemed that Britain would soon succumb, causing Roosevelt to hesitate in sending the material help which Churchill sought. The Prime Minister's advisers suggested passing, passing British technical secrets wholesale in exchange for more rapid assistance. He demurred, saying, if an exchange is to be arranged, I should like to carry it out piece by piece. In March 1941, the Lend-Lease Act was passed by Congress, fulfilling Churchill's famous plan. This broadcast was largely aimed at American audiences. Put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and your blessing. And under providence, all will be well. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Neither the sudden shock of battle nor the long-drawn trials of vigilance and exertion will wear us down. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. How does a leader under enormous stress relieve the pressure? This was my grandfather's recipe. Change is the master key. The cultivation of a hobby and new forms of interest is therefore a policy of first importance to a public man. My grandfather was a man of many interests, but of all those interests, his most favorite diversion was painting. I was with him when he put the final brushstroke to one of his last paintings, a dazzling still life of oranges and lemons. Whenever I look at it, I remember that day and I hope that he is fulfilling his ambition for the afterlife. He wrote, I know of nothing which without exhausting the body more entirely absorbs the mind. When I get to heaven, I mean to spend a considerable portion of my first million years in painting and get to the bottom of the subject. All leaders need someone with whom they can discuss their fears and their successes. Someone who will back them up but tell them when they're getting things wrong. For Churchill, it was his wife, Clementine. She was the only person who could. In 1940, she became alarmed as his temper was suffering under the strain and decided there was no good telling him and having a conversation because he would have shut her up after the first sentence. So she wrote him a letter. She wrote, my darling, I hope you will forgive me if I tell you something which I feel you ought to know. One of the men in your entourage, a devoted friend, has been to me and told me there is a danger of your being generally disliked by your colleagues and subordinates because of your rough and overbearing manner. It seems your private secretaries have decided to behave like schoolboys and take what's coming to them, and then escape out of your presence, shrugging their shoulders. Higher up, if an idea is suggested, say at a conference, you are supposed to be so contemptuous that presently no ideas, good or bad, will be forthcoming. I was astonished and upset, because in all those years I have been accustomed to all those who have worked with and under you, loving you. I said this and was told, no doubt, it's the strain. My darling Winston, I must confess that I have noticed a deterioration in your manner, and that you're not as so kind as you used to be. It is for you to give the orders, and if they are bungled, except for the King, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Speaker, you can sack anyone and everyone. Therefore, with this terrific power, you must combine urbanity, kindness, and if possible, Olympic calm. I cannot bear that those who serve the country and yourself should not love you as well as admire and respect you. Please forgive your loving, and devoted and watchful Clemmy. Without my grandmother, history might have taken a different course. All modern leaders can benefit from the example set by Winston Churchill. I believe that my grandfather's principles of leadership are as relevant today as they were in 1940 and an inspiration to anyone in any field who aspires to lead. I'm going to end with a tribute to my grandfather by his friend and colleague, Duff Cooper. This is the best expression I know of the feelings for him after the war, not just in Britain, but here also in the United States and in the whole of the Western world. When ears were dull and tongues were mute, 
you told of doom to come. When others fingered on the flute, you thundered on the drum. When armies marched and cities burned, and all you said came true, those who had mocked your warnings turned almost too late to you. Then doubt gave way to firm belief, and through five cruel years, you gave us glory in our grief and laughter through our tears. When final honours are bestowed and last accounts are done, then shall we know how much was owed by all the world to one. Thank you very much. Which is your best side? I have no best side. <laughs> it appears everyone in the audience has asked a question, which is good. Uh, well, let's hope they're nice ones. <laughs> well, I have the first question, and I'm sure it's somewhere in this. What would Winston Churchill have done on Brexit? Ah, <clears throat> I don't think he'd have got us there in the first place. I think he'd have avoided it. Because the only reason we got to Brexit was because David Cameron wanted to pull his party into a line. And so he wanted to, to stamp on the whole situation. And he thought a referendum would do it. But of course it didn't. It's caused a huge mess. Huge mess, yes. Yeah. But you, you said once in one of your other talks that he has been quoted by both sides in the mm -hmm. debate. What are the, two, what are the quotes that they're making? Well, they, um, they, they quote, I mean, they've quoted speeches where he said, we must be with Europe, and then others, we must be with, once he was asked, if he, what would he choose, what would he choose, Europe or the deep blue sea? And he said, I would choose the deep blue sea. And on another occasion, he drew three circles. There was Europe, there was America, and there was a circle of Britain, which linked up with both. He wanted to be friends with everybody, but he wanted to be of Europe, but not in Europe. And he wanted to be very close to America. His last words to his last cabinet meeting were, never be separated from America. Did you ever meet Churchill's valet, Frank Sawyer? And if so, what are your memories of him? Unfortunately, I didn't. No, I think he was sort of before my time. I did meet some of his valets, but not that one. That one. What is the one personal interaction you had with your grandfather that influenced your leadership style? Your leadership style. My leadership? Yes. I'm not a leader. <laughs> <laughs> I the, think we would disagree with that. But the one thing <laughs> that he, um, he, did, he did say to me once when I when I was a child and had a row with one of my siblings. He said, never let the sun go down on your wrath. And that was a very good thing, you know, always make up a quarrel because otherwise it just festers. And that was useful advice. Uh, uh, there's a funny story which I think we talked about before we came on. I heard Richard Burton when I was very young tell the story, the great British actor, that um, I think it was, he was performing Macbeth and Churchill was in the front row and they used to call Churchill the old man. My sons call me the old man now, and I, I don't actually appreciate it very much, but it's not because he, they're comparing me to Churchill, but they, they meant that warmly. No, I uh, think the, affectionately, the, the Affectionately. Yes. But uh, uh, what Burton said is that Churchill had a photographic memory and had memorized all of the great Shakespearean plays, and he would say out loud, <laughs> as Richard Burton was saying uh, the lines in the play, he would repeat them while Burton was speaking, but he did it fairly loudly so everybody could hear him, and he tried to speed up the lines to, <laughs> to lose Churchill, or he'd slow down thinking he could confuse Churchill, and by the end of the talk he, he realized that he had failed and Churchill kept up with him the whole time. He probably confused the audience too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been very irritating. Yeah. I can so, so talk about his prodigious memory. Uh, how, where did it come from? Did he, did, he, did he just sit and 
spend time, or could he just automatically read something? Well, he obviously was very good at learning from, a, the, from an early age. When he got to Harrow at the age of 13, they had to, there was a competition for reciting. And this was open to the whole school, from 13-year-olds to 18-year-olds. And he won the competition in his first term for reciting, I can't remember how many hundreds of lines, of Macaulay's Lays of Ancient Rome, and without a single mistake. And so, I mean, he, he was a bad student, not because he was stupid, but because he was bolshy. He wasn't, get, he wasn't interested. The subjects he wasn't interested, he paid no attention to. Latin, maths, he couldn't have cared less about. But what he liked was English and history. And so therefore, he was put in the, put in the he had extra English. The stupid boys, as he said, got taught extra English. And the English master really saw the point of him. And so he then saved some of his essays. So this was a good thing for him. Hmm. That's an interesting story. So how was it that your grandfather and the two greatest threats to Western civilization in the 20th century, first Nazi Germany and then St Stalin's Russia or the Soviet Union, uh, how, did, how did he know ahead of time, ahead of, ahead of everyone else, that these were such threats? Way before World War II in the case of Hitler. Well, I think he did have, have a certain perception where he could see what was likely to happen. And also, he wasn't afraid to face up to it. I think this was part of it, as most people would have wanted to bury it under the carpet. And they said, the First World War was the war to end all wars so that we shouldn't ever have another war. And they just didn't want to hear it. They were closing their ears. And he, was, he had the courage to, to get up and say it. And uh, he also had these people coming, people, he had people coming all through the 30s to Chartwell, his home in Kent, where he was in his wilderness years most of the time, and to tell him what Hitler was doing. And wh when he asked a question, and they came from the ministries in London too, and they'd have been in trouble if they'd been caught. And so he was better informed than the Prime Minister. If he got up to ask a question, he always knew the answer. There is a, a, a scene in um, William Manchester's three-volume biography of your, of your grandfather where one group of people had gone to Chartwell and someone had the audacity to attack politicians and your grandmother asked him to leave the house. Oh, really? Who yes. was that? I can't remember who it was, oh, but I was taken by that because it happened once in our house that someone criticized politicians. My wife did not like it very much. <laughs> so did she tell them to leave? Uh, well, she didn't tell them to leave, but she got very upset. <laughs> particularly for people who've never run for office uh, and never experienced criticism in mm. office. Uh, so uh, I always remembered your grandmother's comment. Yeah, she would that. have been faultlessly loyal. and she, would, she, she was very critical of a lot of his friends, too. Oh, and is she, that right? Yes. She didn't, she didn't like a lot of his friends, no. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> what was... <laughs> what did your... Actually, that may be true with my wife, too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope we haven't got too many friends in the no, audience. No, no, I have friends here. <laughs> <laughs> what did uh, your grandfather believe the best way to deal with Stalin was after World War II? Ah, well, that's a very good question, but I think you'd better answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to answer it, but, uh, but he, he actually uh, took a harder line, but he, he did talk about, uh, in the 1950s, he was the only pol major political figure, in fact, I'm not even sure there are any political scientists, he said the Russian Empire in Eastern Europe would last 35 years in the early 1950s. How long did it last? 35 years. His I mean, from greatest, point. One, I mean, his, one of his greatest regrets was, I mean, he, was, he didn't want to die before the Berlin Wall came down, and he did. I mean, he was, he was that really upset him so much. And, you know, he had to put up with Stalin, but he didn't like to. Exactly, exactly. It was the lesser of two evils. What would you say at the end of your grandfather's life was his greatest accomplishment? To have kept Britain in the war until the Americans joined us. Which was a year and a half. They were mm -hmm. completely alone. Yeah. I mean, otherwise that would have been, I mean, ha that has to be. Wouldn't you agree Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. Because we would not have the mm -hmm. base to exactly. the, uh, for, for the uh, invasion of Normandy right. and the liberation of Europe. Absolutely. And then Hitler, if he'd got the whole of Europe and he'd got the Japanese too, he would have been trying to do a pincer movement. Of course, he wouldn't have managed with the great United States, but right. you never know. He would have done his blinking best to do it. Uh, yes. 
<laughs> Are there aspects of your grandfather's character and temperament that you saw that he did not show to the public? Well, yes. I mean, for instance, you know, you look at the film The Darkest Hour, where he's, you know, very strong and pushing along and, and trying to fight everyone. I mean, all I saw something completely different. I saw a man who was, because he'd had rather a bleak childhood himself, wanted his family life to be really lovely and cosy. He loved animals. He loved painting. And I mean, he was, you know, people think that he would have been this tough character at home. He wasn't at all. He was an absolute pussycat. <laughs> was your grandmother the disciplinarian? No, she wasn't a disciplinarian. I was. I mean, I don't know. We must have been awfully goody-goody children because we were never, barely ever told off by them. But, but she was. I mean, she was certainly. Had she? She was far more critical than he was. Hmm. So he had two other careers that were not in politics but related to it. One was as a writer, and the other was a painter. Why don't you talk about those two skills well, that he had? Well, he had been asked what he was. Most people would think he would have said he was a politician. He would have said he was a writer. He was writing how he earned his money. And all through his life, he was writing. Right from early on, when he was in India, he was writing about uh, the, the battles they were fighting there. And so throughout his life, he was writing, right up to the last books that he wrote, The History of the English-Speaking Peoples. And, and he wrote novels, too, did he not? Only one, which he advised his friends never to read. <laughs> <laughs> which was, in fact, autobiographical in a sort ah, of way. Okay. <laughs> Just really wrote uh, novels, too, I think, didn't he, when he was prime minister? Did he? I think he did. I think he wrote some novels, Victorian novels. I'm not sure they were very good, but <laughs> he was the other great British conservative leader in the 19th century. So um, what were your, we talked about this the other day, but I think it's worth repeating. What were your grandfather's failures? Because we're, we're lionizing him now, which is appropriate, but... He did make some mistakes. He did make some mistakes. But one mistake that he made was India. I think he'd, he was a great monarchist, and he'd grown up in the empire. When, you know, I mean, when I was at school, the atlases, I mean, 75% of the world seemed to be pink and belonged to the British Empire. And so he was of his time. And so he didn't, couldn't see the fact that the idea that we would lose India, and that was a mistake. And the other mistake he made at that time was also supporting Edward VIII and thinking that he could have a morganatic marriage with Mrs. Simpson. And that was very unpopular. Did it affect his relationship with uh, his brother, the... the, the, the uh the king who did become king. In fact, I think Elizabeth blamed uh, uh, the, 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 the duke who didn't become king for his father's death because she, he was not prepared to be king. No, not at all. And he, he was a shy man and he had a stammer, as we saw in that, um, there was another film, um, yeah. the, the King's Speech. The King's Speech. But yes. he, no, but I mean, the fact is that she was very protective of him. And clearly, that, I mean, Edward VIII was, would have been a disastrous king. He would have been. With or without king. Mrs. Simpson. That's right. But Actually, he was sympathetic to the Germans at one point, yes, was he? Yes, absolutely he was. They went straight off and met Hitler. Yeah. And then he was sent off to Bermuda, I think it was, to be the governor general and ah. kept out of the way. So what about the Gallipoli campaign? You talked about that actually in your, that that, that well, was the low point of his career. It was the low point, absolutely the low point. And it was unjustly in a way the low point because it was a great idea, but he didn't have, he didn't have the support for it. And, so, uh, and people remembered it afterwards. But you know, nowadays, no one, when they make a mistake, no one ever resigns. Then people did, and he immediately resigned and went off to fight in the trenches, yeah, yeah. which must have been a, quite a thing to do. I mean, he couldn't have been a very fit man at that stage, but he did. And then he bounced back. He did. He did. So um, Churchill was defeated after the Second World War, which is, I've had my, some of my students say, how could that possibly be true? And you, you get a good e explanation, part of which was the nature of your political system. Why don't you describe why it happened and then what the consequences were? 
Well, we don't, we don't elect a person, a man or a woman. <coughs> we elect a party. So we don't have the name of... We, we wouldn't have had Churchill's name on the ballot paper. If they had, everyone would have voted Churchill, I think. But they would, you have the name of the candidate who's standing for your local area. And he did no electioneering during the war. He was only concentrating on one thing. His only objective was to win the war. And, and also, a lot of people thought that he was good at war and wouldn't be any good at peace and that the country needed to be reformed. But I spoke to the two people who were with him when he had got it, the penny dropped that he'd actually, that we'd, they'd lost the election. And this was the secretary who was portrayed so sympathetically in Darkest Hour, Elizabeth Nell, and his male stenographer who was with him when he's, he was walking up and down his room in the White House and there was a knock on the door and he said, come in, and in came the Prime Minister, in came the President, and his towel dropped to the floor and he said, you see, Mr. President, I have nothing to hide from you. <laughs> <laughs> and they both, and they said that when the, when the news came in and he knew that he'd lost, they all three sat down and had a good cry together, which is rather charming in a way, isn't it? Is, it? it is. So I saw pictures of Churchill writing his books, and he actually didn't write the books. He dictated them. He dictated them. 44 books he dictated? Day and night. And he wore out the stenographers, the reporting was. Well, they had to be on uh, duty day and night because what his routine was, he'd have his breakfast in bed, and I used to love going to see him having his breakfast in bed. It'd be the secretary maybe taking dictation, the dog running around, the cat snuggled up by his side, and Toby the Budgerigar swooping in to share the breakfast. And that would happen all the time. But then he'd go out, so then he'd go out for a walk. Then, in the afternoon, he'd go to bed. But somehow he managed to fit in all this work. But then after dinner, and after dinner we'd usually have a film, and then we'd all go to bed, and he then would start working. So the secretaries had to have great stamina, and then he'd say he'd go to bed and he'd say, well, don't worry, I don't need that till 8 o'clock in the morning. So the secretary would have to type <laughs> it up, having taken it down in shorthand. Wow. But so only the strong ones stayed the course. Stayed the course. <laughs> and they, can, if they did, they imagine, adored him. I can imagine. So there have been hundreds of biographies of Churchill, very aspect of, in fact, the Prime Minister of Britain, uh, Boris Johnson, wrote his own book. My wife gave it to me for Christmas. And uh, what do you think of Boris Johnson's book? I think Boris Johnson's look is quite interesting because it's a different, it appeals, it brings a, my grandfather to another audience. It's young people like that much yes. better. He takes you on a journey and I think it's, it's rather good. He's a very intelligent man. Uh, he is a very, uh, classically trained, I think, in Greek and Latin, and all yes. that, which is n very few politicians mm. in your country and certainly not in our country are trained in And the I don't think we really need that, but I mean, I don't know whether that's a necessary attribute. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we might have a disagreement on that. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the, uh, uh, my, my question to you is, um, which of the biographies of Churchill were the best in, you, in your view? Put aside Boris Johnson, because that's not a complete no, no, biography. No, no, that's different. Yeah, no. um, well, as far as I can concern, the Churchill Bible is Martin Gilbert. He's the go-to person yes. for references. He's got it all there, and or almost all, but Andrew Roberts has just written, and he got into the Royal Archives, which Martin Gilbert. So there's always somewhere else to go, but I think Martin Gilbert, I mean, if you can get through it all, I mean, just the, the biography takes this much space, and then the kind of two or three companion volumes for every one, so you need a whole library for him. And I think that William Manchester's were very good, not always accurate, but pretty, very readable. Do you think Andrew Roberts was accurate? I imagine he was. <coughs> I don't know. I haven't, haven't studied it to, to decide whether he, I think he probably was. I think he was probably meticulous. But of course, you know, it's always, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he did get extra material. But I think that Martin, uh, um, William Manchester 
were very readable and very good. But I think the last one was unfortunate. He died before he could finish, could finish it. it. And I think there's a, some journal, Paul Allen, was his name? Yes. So who he, who yes, finished it yes, for yes, him. But it was a, you could tell it was a different hand. Different hand, yes. exactly. I think he did the research The one I didn't it. like was Roy Jenkins. I read that. Uh, uh, he's, I thought it was very pretentious. And he was trying to, it was too much of Roy, or as he would have called himself, Roy. He couldn't pronounce his <laughs> R's. And too much of him in it. I had, I had read it, actually. I had an accident, and I was recovering. This is when I was in office. And President Bush said to President Bush 43 said, so what did you do, Andrew? I said, well, I read this biography by Roy Jenkins. And before I could comment on it, he said, I think I'll read it. He read, wrote down, I asked Andy Carr, and he said, he read the whole thing, Andrew. He didn't tell me what he thought of it. But <laughs> well, there's too many, um, too much French, too much Latin. I mean, I think it's offensive to the reader, because yeah. if, if you understand it, you don't notice it. But if you don't, and I mean, I speak French, but I had to go looking it up, and I thought, how irritating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was showing off, he was distancing himself as far as he could from the miner's cottage. <laughs> OK. Well, I think I've gone through most of the questions in the list. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that you would like to add at the end here? Well, perhaps I'd, what I'd like to say is that there were, my grandfather always had to have a strong woman at his side. For the first 20 years of his life, it was his nanny, Mrs. Everest, who was absolutely his rock. His parents were distant. Not, I mean, not very so different from the other parents of his contemporaries, but they certainly weren't what the sort of parents that we see nowadays. And she died when he was 20, and he said, I lost the most intimate friend that I had for the whole the first 20 years of my life. And then he had his mother, who he hadn't had a close relationship with, but who he, they developed one, and he said it was less like mother and son than brother and sister. And she was incredibly useful to him. She had such good contacts, and he used them constantly. So she paved the way and oiled the wheels of his life for 14 years. And then it was my grandmother. And so these were the three big influences. And I mean, Mrs. Everest's nanny was a great, it was, really was a great influence. She was a really strong minded woman. I think she was great influence on his character hmm. and even influence where he bought the family home because she came from Kent and said Kent was the garden of England and the best place in the world so he went and bought a house in Kent. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, Churchill was also a union member. He was a member of the Bricklayers. Bricklayers Union, right? union yes. And he used to make, to make brick walls. Oh, that, was, that was sort of stress busting. Yes. I mean like his painting which was an absolute joy to him. But the bricklaying, he, I mean, he, there's a lot of bricks that have been laid at Chartwell, but he, he didn't lay them all, but he did lay quite a lot, and he used to enjoy doing it, and I think it was very peaceful. Once I was in Miami, and I went to have a drink somewhere, and they said, we want to show you something. And they took me out in the garden and showed me a wall, and they said, that row there, you see, your grandfather laid that. He was here having a drink, and he said, I see you're building a wall, I can have a go. And he had a go and laid on it. <laughs> The next time I went back, that house was for sale. I don't know how much he'd added to the value of it. <laughs> <laughs> and he painted 500 pictures, you said? He, when he died, he'd painted more than 500 pictures. At, at one point, your grandmother was, what, did not have a lot of money, and what she had to do was, I saw the papers in Britain, she had to auction some of the Well, that was quite ridiculous, because it wasn't that she didn't. I mean, she, she, any bank would have lent her the money. I mean, it somehow, some, uh, someone misguided advised her. It was very embarrassing. Oh, and so that we were all very upset about that, but some, some silly fool advised her that she should do this. And you know, people thought, you know, old age pensioners were, were sending her sort of biscuits and things. I mean, it was really pathetic, you know, it was silly. I mean, she was perfectly, uh, you know, there she was living in a very nice flat with, you know, two maids and a cook. I mean, you couldn't say she was on the bread line, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact was, you know, that was, she was badly, very badly advised. But um, no, it was, but it was a joy growing up with them. They were lovely. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. It's been a delight to have you. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much.